Well, it's funny you mention that because Disney is coming out with a new movie. This is a true story. I don't know if you guys know about this yet, but Christopher Steele, have you heard about this? Disney has a movie coming out. It's an interview documentary with George Stephanopoulos is going to be doing the interviewing of Christopher Steele. And it's going to play, I guess, on Hulu, which I didn't know was owned by Disney, but it's going to be on Monday night, so you guys be watching something else, I'm sure. So, so we have, uh, just so you all know, we've got 500 people here. Thank you all for being here live. But... We have over 2,000 people watching live right now across the country. And Jim, one of the things, I was in your district a couple years ago, yeah. and one of the things that I've noticed is, when because we're a little bit shell-shocked here, you're kind of in the Alamo of California, the last bastion of freedom that there is, is right here in the San Joaquin Valley. You go to Hollywood, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, you won't be as uh, well-received as you are here. In fact, if I were you, I would probably wear a disguise, I'd put your mask on if I were you. But... It's amazing, just for all you to know that are out here in the crowd, it is amazing when I go across the country just how many groups just like this everywhere I go. And I've been, it's been such an honor to me to get out and see, you know, because a lot of times we get stuck in the swamp, we're in the building, you know, we get, you kind of get a little bit, you know, down because you're dealing with Pelosi and you're seeing the Congress completely fall apart. I mean, it's really like living hell practically for the most part. But when you get out to real America where people are actually doing things, growing things, manufacturing things, and you see that all over the Midwest. I mean, you see the power of the mighty Mississippi, the river system. It's just, it's just absolutely incredible. So I want to thank everybody who's watching tonight, everybody for being here. But uh, tonight is a, a night, Jim, where I get to interview you. So, but I think that what a lot of people would like to know is kind of your history, right? We kind of hear a little bit about you, that you were a wrestling champ, and blah, blah, blah. But what made you decide one day to say, forget it, I'm going to run for public office? Because we have a lot of people here who we'd like to get to run for public office. Um, no, good, great question. Um, you get married, my, my lovely wife Polly's sitting over here with Elizabeth somewhere. Um, you, get, you get married, we have four, we have we have four children, um, Rachel, Benjamin, Jesse, Isaac, and we uh, all four are married. We have four granddaughters and another one on the way. So when you get married, though, and you have children, you, you get tired of government telling you what to do and taking your money, and you look at life differently. And frankly, I was, I was, in, I was assistant wrestling coach at Ohio State University. I was looking to do something different. Um, state representative position opened up, and I said, I think I'm going to run for state rep. I, went, I, I remember I went and talked to the county leaders, where I'm from, it's all about the primary. It's like, it's out, out, like right here, you, you got to win the Republican primary. I went and talked to the party leaders, and they all told me, they said, well, you're a nice young guy, but this two-term county commissioner is going to win. You probably shouldn't run. And I said, we'll see, right? <laughs> I, said, I, I always say that's, wh that's why they played the game on Friday night. You know, you, you, you got you to find, you got to play the game to find out who's going to win. And so we just had a lot of good people like all you folks in this room help us knock on doors. We just ran circles around this guy, and we won, and I've been at it ever since. Um, the part I like most about it is when, frankly, when you're in a committee hearing and the guy on the witness stand or the person on the witness stand, you know, misled or lied to the American people, that's trying to, trying to pin them down. To me, that is the closest to a wrestling match you can get when you're an old guy like me. So I, I like that. I like that part. And so does, and so does Congressman so, Nunes. <laughs> so when... Uh... Let's go back to uh, all the, the Russia hoax and all that starts. And you mentioned a little bit about that in your opening speech. But what kind of made you, because I get asked this question all the time, what made me think that there was no, that this was all bogus and a made-up story? But I've never asked you that question. What made you think that it was a bogus story and a hoax? I started hearing a few of the things you were saying, Devin. Um, and to be honest, um, Mark Meadows is one of our, our, our good friends in, in D.C. Mark and I were talking, and um, Molly Hemingway. So there were about five of us, five or six of us in the Congress who started pushing back. Devin was the lead guy out of the gate. And then there were maybe half a dozen to a dozen reporters who actually report and do, you know, actually do what you're supposed to do in the media. 
And Molly Hemingway was one of them. And she wrote this piece on the dossier, all the myths about the myths and falsehoods about the dossier. And I remember I was reading it. Polly and I were driving home from D.C. to Ohio. And I'm reading it. And I'm thinking, this, this is exactly what I was thinking was going on. And I actually called her up and started talking to her about it. And then I called Mark on the phone and started talking to him about it. And we just decided Devin could do a lot from the Intel Committee, but we, had, we could do some more things public in the Oversight Committee. So Mark and I just dug into this thing, working with Devin and his team. And it, uh, but it sort of started with Molly's piece in 2017 about the dossier. And then, of course, things really heated up, as you all know, when Devin did his memo. And when that came out, and then just on and on it played. And then we got to be in the depositions with Mr. Comey, Mr. McCabe, because I'm on the Judiciary Committee and the Oversight Committee that, that do most of the investigating in Congress. And then it just kept building. And finally, when Bob Mueller did his pathetic performance in front of our committee, we all understood that, guess what? Devin Nunes was right, right from the get-go. Um, and um, so that's how it worked for me. Well. It's funny you mention that because Disney is coming out with a new movie. This is a true story. I don't know if you guys know about this yet, but Christopher Steele, have you heard about this? Disney has a movie coming out. It's an interview documentary with George Stephanopoulos is going to be doing the interviewing of Christopher Steele. And it's going to play, I guess, on Hulu, which I didn't know was owned by Disney, but it's going to be on Monday night, so you guys will be watching something else, I'm sure. But... <laughs> It's part of what we deal with in Washington now is it's the propaganda media that you mentioned. There's very few real reporters, and so many of them now are, you know, covered by the big companies, the big either woke corporations yeah. or the tech companies. And now with Disney coming out and doing this, you can't help but think they're just trying to rehash this again. Yeah. Like, like, no way would you get a guy like Steele who just made a bunch of crap up and then create a Disney film about it. I mean, it's really incredible that they're willing to do it. Well, if you want, I'll make a shameless plug here. If, uh, if after you watch that, if you want the truth, our, the book I'm writing is coming out on November 23rd. It's called Do What You Said You Do. Buy our book, and we'll give you the truth on that situation. Um, the, um, and buy Devin's book, I too. Didn't know you, I didn't know you had a book. Yeah, out. it's coming out on the, tw on the, on the 23rd. It's, the title is Do What You Said You Would Do. Um, but yeah, I mean, think about that. So, so remember... The basics of the Clinton I'm trying to decide, should I read you, yours first or Adam Schiff's book first? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but the Clinton camp, remember how it worked. The Clinton campaign hired the law firm Perkins Coie, right, who hired Fusion GPS, who hired Christopher Steele, who went and made up a bunch of stuff, National Enquirer garbage, threw it into this thing they called a dossier. They took it to the secret court, and that became the basis to launch the, launch the investigation. And oh, by the way, just a couple weeks ago, one of the lawyers at Perkins Coie, the firm the Clinton campaign hired, Michael Zussman, he, he took out all the middlemen. He just went straight to the FBI and gave them false information on President Trump. He went, and not just anyone at the FBI. Who did he go to see? Jim Baker, the chief counsel at the FBI, gave him information, and that became the basis for also launching the investigation into President Trump. And of course, a few weeks ago, Michael Zussman was indicted by the special counsel. Yeah. So, Jim, we'll switch topics here because it's on the mind of a lot of Americans right now, and that is the forced vaccines, forced vaccinations. Uh, and if you guys don't know, Jim is the top Republican on the Judiciary Committee, so this issue really is in, in front of him. Now, don't get mad at him, but he doesn't control the schedule. He doesn't have the gavel. All he can do is basically do events like we're doing tonight and you know, stay, you know, say things in a strong way, but he doesn't have subpoena power. So, as Trey Gowdy, our friend, used to say, you know, we don't even have badges or guns. Now we don't even have gavels. But talk to us about how you see this playing out. I know in Ohio they're not doing the crazy things like they're doing here. But how do you see it playing out on the local levels and then, of course, the state and national level? How are you viewing this right now as to, you know, how we're going to try to fight back for the American people who don't want forced vaccines like we're seeing across the, the United States? It'll get challenged in court, but that takes time. Um, that's, I think, one aspect of this. Uh, second is, I think the people are way past it. You know, just, just the, the people are, we're, I mean, look at this audience. We're, we're ready to move on, run our lives, you know, conduct our lives, our business, our communities, our churches, our schools, our work, like, like we're supposed to as Americans who actually value liberty and, and, and freedom. The third thing I would point out is the, the number one cheerleader for all this stuff, Dr. Fauci, has misled this, has misled this country... Let me just give you an example. 
January 31st, 2020, 1032 p.m., Dr. Fauci gets an email from Dr. Christian Anderson, one of these virologists he's handed your tax dollars out to over the years to do research. Dr. Anderson sends him an email, 10.32 p.m., January 31st, 2020, or more than a year and a half ago. Email says, virus looks engineered, virus not consistent with evolutionary theory. That is a fancy way of saying this thing came from a lab, right? So now we don't know for sure, but all the evidence points in that direction. So what did Dr. Fauci do? Went out and misled us for the last year and a half, downplayed, said, no, no, you're crazy. You, Devin Nunes, Jim Jordan, you're conspiracy theorists if you believe it came from a lab. Baloney. And we had Dr. Girard come and test, who was on the White House task force with President Trump, Dr. Girard testified and said, if we would have known this thing likely came from a lab, that would have made a difference and potentially could have saved lives. But no, 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 Fauci had to cover his backside because of what he was funding with your tax dollars. So the other thing we, we do is what Devin just mentioned, you talk about this Fauci guy. And by the way, when did Dr. Fauci ever put his name on a ballot? He ever run for office? Did, I mean, this, this is one thing that just bugs the heck out of me. Jim Comey ever run for office? Lois, remember Lois Lerner who went after folks like you? Did she ever run for office? How about General Milley? His name ever on a ballot? The way our system works is you put your name on the ballot, you go talk to the people who you want the privilege of representing. If they elect you, then you make the decisions, not the unelected people like Fauci. So that's something else we got to continue to point out. And then don't, of course, forget the hypocrisy of Nancy Pelosi. You know, at the, you, you just reminded me, the beginning of this pandemic, you know, conveniently they have forgotten this, amnesia, Pelosi was dancing around in Chinatown at the beginning, calling Trump a racist, you know, which is, what, which is really what they drop back to. When, when all else fails, they go to their cults that they worship, right? If it's not global warming that they blame for the forest fires, you're lucky. You basically beat the fires by about, we had a little storm come through. Uh, the fires are still burning up there, but you couldn't even breathe outside here. I mean, it was so awful. And of course, they blame global warming. Then when they can't blame global warming, they call everybody a white supremacist. And when they can't blame, when that doesn't work, then they just blame Russia, yeah. you've noticed. <laughs> but Pelosi, you know, wears these, it's, so, it's such a joke, uh, because she wears these designer masks, right? They don't, they're not real masks. They're not the, what Fauci, you know, Fauci first told us not to wear a mask, then he told us to wear a mask, then he told us to wear two masks. And the whole thing was you had to wear an N95 mask or better. That's what the CDC actually said. That's still the case. So you have Pelosi and all these people running around lecturing all of us about, these, about masks when she wears a fake mask. It probably costs $300 more than you know, most of the clothes that I wear. But it's like a designer mask that you're buying at, you know, I don't know where she shops, but some fancy store that I don't even know how to pronounce the name, I'm sure. So, Jim, the hypocrisy no knows, bound, no, knows no bounds in Washington. And it's been really nasty the last you know, year or so since uh, COVID. But what kind of, can I give your version of how you see how they've progressed uh, since Trump uh, left office? Just some of the things that, that are on your radar that they continue to do to take away our freedoms. Well, I actually used the term in an interview last week. I haven't, I've never done before. I, I use the term communism and in the accelerated march towards this radical socialist you know, kind of country they, they want. But, but you, you, you know, think about it. You had, uh, Fauci said about a week and a half ago, uh, give up your freedom for the greater good. Sounds like a line straight out of Karl Marx. Then you had um, the, this, the crazy spending they're trying to do. You know, it's close to $5 trillion. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Then you have the Attorney General of the United States in response to a letter he received from the School Board Association, five days later, later issues a, a memo to the director of the FBI about how they're going to monitor threats at school board, local school board meetings. I mean, what, first of all, what's the federal government, federal law enforcement trying to get involved in local school board issues? So you start looking at all this, and it's, it's things we never thought would happen. I had a, had a friend text me a week or so ago, and he, he said, I wake up every morning thinking it can't get worse. By the end of the day, Democrats prove me wrong. And it's, it's, that's, that's what scares people. For the first time, I've had folks I've had the privilege of representing in the 4th District of Ohio, and, and frankly, around the country, come up to me and say, I'm afraid. I actually fear the government. And it's, it's, that's not supposed to be that way in this great country, but people are nervous. And it's based on real experience, based on the fact that the IRS targeted conservatives for their political speech. It's based on the fact what the FBI, that Devin dis first discovered what they were doing to a presidential campaign, spying on four Americans associated with President Trump's campaign. And now we see what 
Merrick Garland wants to do with, with the FBI and school boards, what Fauci continues to try to do to the country, that's the scary part. So when I tell you thank you for being involved, I mean it. It's, it's, it is a, someone once said, um, every third generation in this country has had to do something big. First guy, the, the, you know, 1776, those guys, what they did, started this experiment in liberty we call America, unbelievable what they did. Three generations later, civil war, holding this country together, getting rid of the evil of slavery, very difficult time. But the Americans rose to the occasion. Three generations after that, World War II, defeating Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, amazing generation, the greatest generation it's been called, appropriately so. Well, here we are three generations later, maybe it's our turn to stand up and defend this, what this country is really about. So uh, that's what we got to focus on. So Jim, this $5 trillion bill you mentioned, um, we're right on the wire, right? There's 50-50 Senate, four votes in the House. Uh, kind of give the crowd and the audience, what are your top, as you look at this bill, what should we be, number one, most concerned about, and how do you see this moving forward within the course of the next month or so? <laughs> Great question, but what we should be most concerned about. Yeah, we have another hour, so yeah. just relax, folks. Well, well what, what we should be most concerned about is that, that it'll pass, because there's, there's just nothing, there's bad tax policy in it, there's bad, this, the Green New Deal policy, you could just go down, get down the list, but all the policies are bad, but again, what frightens me the most is what they're doing to the First Amendment, what they're doing to freedom. Because that's the, I mean, we can rebound, <clears throat> excuse me, we can rebound from bad policy, bad taxes, bad, it takes a while sometimes, particularly as bad as they're doing. But what's tough is when they take away the, when they, when they go after the First Amendment and the, the Constitution. Um, so that's what makes me, <clears throat> excuse me, the most nervous. Um, let's just hope Senator Manchin keeps his word, so far he has. Let's hope that Kristen Sinema, Senator Sinema does the same and that they can't get this done. And um, if they can't, we can hold them off, get to the next election, then we'll be at a stalemate and start priming the pump for President Trump for, thank you, for running for re-election. So we've been, we've been, like I said, we've been going around the country, we've been doing these, we've been broadcasting live. You can actually go back later and watch it on Rumble. Uh, and I've talked, every, every speech that I give, and Jim knows this, I encourage people, we've got to get away from these big tech tyrants. They're really dangerous. You saw it, you know, whether it was right before the election. You want to talk about election fraud, it's when you keep people from knowing what the president's son was actually doing and is continuing to do, whether it be the artwork sales. But Jim was actually the low bidder. He bid 69000 <laughs> Yeah. and it sold for 75000 I think. But, but Jim, that's, look, this is going to be, all the way to the election, we're going to be fighting big tech. Right now, we're broadcasting on Rumble. People can go to Parler now. Parler's back up and going. Bezos destroyed Parler. Apple destroyed Parler. It's back. There were nearly 20 million Americans. I know you're on there. I'm on there. Um, but they've successfully cut off our ability to communicate, not just to the American people in the world, to communicate with each other, which is even more concerning. So Jim and I don't have a clean way to, to communicate with you all. Uh, because everybody's on different platforms, and we know that all the big tech companies are censoring us. You're not going to see what, you know, what Jim and I want you to see. Even if you're on our email list, it doesn't guarantee that that email is not going to end up in you know, outer space somewhere, right? It just doesn't, doesn't get through. So people want to know also, Jim, uh, how can we rein in these big tech companies who are clearly influenced the last election? Yeah. $420 million from Mark Zuckerberg that he spent on the last election. He's probably going to spend it again. That's why they're threatening him right now. What do we do between now and then to take these guys on, and what can we do about it if we get the majority back? Be between now and then, we, we, we do what we're doing now. We talk about it. We, we, we use alternative platforms. Uh, when we get back the majority and when we get back the White House, we've got to pass uh, the bill that takes away their liability protection, the so-called Section 230. That, that's a minimum. Um, I think we have to look at the antitrust issue. We may have to break these, these companies up. I mean, big, powerful companies that have this much control. It's happened in, in, our, in, in, in our history where we've done that. Uh, so I think we have to look at that. But certainly we need more transparency and accountability. They need to tell us, oh, if they're going to they're gonna throttle back some, some tweet or some post or something you do, they need to tell us why. And frankly, we need to, we need to get 
the ability for this issue to the Supreme Court, we need to make that happen faster. So this is one thing we're looking at the, on the Judiciary Committee legislation. Thomas has indicated, it seems, that he wants to deal with this situation, this case. Um, so we need to speed that up. We're looking at legislation in our committee, Republicans on our committee on, on, on doing that. But transparency, speed, and then the accountability issue is take away their liability protection. That has to happen day one when we get back in the majority and we have the White House. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, any, uh, we're going to call back up uh, James Henderson, the chairman of the party. Uh, but uh, Jim, any last words for our group here? Everybody watching on Rumble in here? Um, I will just say my, my, uh, my favorite scripture verse is 2 Timothy 4.7. Paul's the old guy giving advice to the young guy, Timothy. And he says, what? Fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. And I tell people I love that verse because it's not wimpy words, right? It's American. It's, it's a verse I think the good Lord kind of designed for our country. Fight, finish, keep. That is our charge. Let's make sure we do that. And if we do, we'll be just fine. And that's what we're doing here tonight. So thank you so much, everybody. Jim Jordan, let's give him a round of applause. Jim Jordan, Devin Nunes. <laughs>